2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 through 12. I'll put it on the screen for those of us in the sanctuary this afternoon. The Word of God from the King James text today reads, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Listen now. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that we may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, the day Jesus becomes me. Now, everybody's looking at me funny. Nobody can quite figure out that title. Well, then I've accomplished my task. Amen. I like to give titles that really kind of make you think. But when you put it all, when I put it all together for you, you won't forget it. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful move of the Holy Ghost we feel in the house of the Lord today. We thank you for your presence, God. You're real. It's the old song says he's real. It's real. Praise God. I know it's real. It's the Holy Ghost and fire. And I know, I know it's real. Jesus anoint today the messenger of God. Help me to deliver this very important word to your people. Allow my lips of clay. Lord, to be moved by the Holy Ghost, that I might speak that which is in need of being spoken. And Lord, that I might remain silent where my flesh would try to interfere and speak. Oh God, today challenge us, change us, mold us more and more into your image. For that is the work of your word and your spirit. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus precious holy name amen praise god and amen. amen i have a little byline on my display up here today on my illustration there's an illustration of a gentleman those of you on line probably can't see it very well but there's a gentleman down here occupying this much of the picture He's standing before a great staircase, and at the top of the staircase, you can just barely make out the outline of a throne and one who sits upon the throne. And obviously, this is an illustration of the day of judgment when we each will stand before the Lord, as the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 through 12, when we each will stand before the Lord and give account for those things which we have done in the flesh. See, a lot of people don't want to recognize we are spiritual beings first. We are not spiritual beings second. We are spiritual beings first. And the experience that we are having in the flesh is but a drop in the bucket to what God has created for us.
to experience. You see, we're, we're going through this little vapor of time. We're going through this little tiny bit of time here on earth. And when we get into eternity, we'll realize what a little bit of time we really were. We're going to look back and think, my Lord, all the worry and all the fret and all the fear I expressed, all the anxiety I went through, for what? It was such a short experience. It was such a short time. But God created us first and foremost spiritual beings. He created Adam a living soul. He created Adam, the Word of God declares, in his own image. Mm -hmm. The flesh is secondary. This is something we occupy. Our spirit occupies this form of flesh and bone. And what we're going to answer to God for is what we did while we went through this earthly experience. While we were in possession of this body. While we had the opportunity to use this form for good or for evil. And we're going to answer for everything we've done in this flesh. This is what Paul tells us. In 2 Corinthians today. And I put a little byline on my message today. On our illustration. Above the title it says. The scariest day in eternity. The day Jesus becomes me. We're, we're in that season now. Where children are getting geared up and ready. For Halloween. As believers, we don't celebrate Halloween. It's a pagan holiday and it has nothing to do with God's people or God's church. So we do not celebrate Halloween. But the world does. And interestingly enough, this is a holiday when people just love to celebrate death. They love to celebrate everything and anything that scares them. They love to be terrified. Well, honey, then you ought to love this message today. Amen. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Meaning, Knowing that if we're going to stand before God and answer for everything we've ever done in the flesh, honey, God won't terrify us. He's going to scare us to death, and I tell the truth. There ain't nobody going to stand before God that day and not be terrified at what they're going to see on that screen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. There ain't nobody... It's going to look at everything we've done in our life and be able to say, yes, Lord, wasn't that lovely? Yes, Lord, wasn't that perfect? My goodness, Jesus. Isn't it? I don't know how you left me down there so long without translating me on up to glory. I don't know why you didn't send a fiery chariot after me, Lord. I don't know why you didn't send a whirlwind for me, Lord. Good boy, I'll tell you what, I sure nailed it. <laughs> boy, I mean to tell you, I've done so good, Jesus. Uh, you know, I went swimming a time or two, and Lord, I don't know how you allowed me to sink down into that water. My goodness, I was so good and so pure and so perfect. I should have just walked right out on the surface of it. Am I telling the truth? Ain't nobody going to have that experience when we stand before the Lord. Nobody. Paul, James, John, Matthew, Mark, none of us. And I've got news for you. There's something even scarier about that day. There's something even more terrifying about that day than simply the fact that we're going to answer for those things which we have done in the flesh. There's a passage of Scripture that oftentimes Christians quote it very seldom to believers really give it a lot of weight. This is a passage that tends to be relegated to one of the nominal scriptures. It, it doesn't hold a great deal of import, but I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to fill you in as I scare you to death telling you about the day Jesus becomes you. I'm going to tell you about the scariest day in eternity when you stand before God in the judgment. I'll tell you why this is the scariest day in eternity. 
See, the day is coming when we will stand before the Lord to be judged for those deeds which we have done in the flesh. And listen to me carefully now. This explains my title. And we shall be judged by the Lord, listen to me now, with the same attitudes and intensity that we exercised as we sat in judgment of others. Ooh. That makes that day even worse. Because that day as the Lord Jesus Christ sits upon the white judgment throne, listen to me, He will briefly become us. Oh my goodness. The God of all creation has told us with his own lips, with his own, this isn't something Paul passed on to us, this isn't something Peter passed on to us, or Mark or John, this is something the Lord himself told us in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, he said, judge not, that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. The Lord said, Judge not that ye be not judged. You see, the sad thing a lot of believers fail to realize is we actually have the opportunity, and most of us have missed the opportunity already, so there's no sense even worrying about it. But for every born-again believer who comes to the Lord this afternoon and starts their walk with God immediately after this message, listen, i got news for you. You have the opportunity on Judgment Day to walk past the throne and have the Lord simply say, Welcome home. No judgment for you. No need to stop. Oh my goodness, did you hear what I just said? You had the opportunity as a believer, you had the opportunity to literally walk past the throne of judgment, stop just long enough for the Lord to say, you're clear, you're good, go on. Oh my goodness, wouldn't that be lovely? See, Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged. He said, if you don't judge at all, you will not be judged at all. Did you hear what I just said? If you don't judge at all, then you will not be judged at all. Well, the problem is most of us already missed that by a mile. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. So that opportunity is lost to us. But listen to what the Lord said in Luke 6, 35 through 38. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward will be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Listen. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Oh my goodness. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it will be measured to you again. Once again we see Jesus speaking the words, Judge not, and ye shall not 
be judged. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Good Lord, I wish somebody would have told me this as I was getting up off the altar of repentance. My God, I wish somebody would have told me this the day I received the Holy Ghost. I wish somebody would have told me this as I was coming out of the waters of baptism in Jesus' name. You're starting with a clean slate, son. You're starting brand new, son. Listen, if you will walk without judgment and condemnation, Condemnation. You can literally avoid judgment and condemnation when you stand in the presence of King Jesus. I wish somebody would have told me this. Mm -hmm. But instead, these passages are set aside as though the point being made here is some nominal point. It's a little point. It's not a major point concerning doctrine and dogma. Oh, honey, yes it is. The child of God needs to be aware of this more than they need to be aware of almost anything. If you want to avoid trouble when you stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, the scariest day in all of eternity for you and I, when you stand before the Lord on that scary day, the last thing in the world you want to see Him do, listen to me now, is morph into you. And start judging your actions and your behavior. Oh my God, have mercy. The way you would have judged someone else doing and saying and acting the same way. Now that scares you to death, don't it? Yeah. Lord, have mercy. I won't, it scares me. I don't stand up here and preach because I'm perfect. I stand up here and preach because God's called me to lead others and help others find the cross. My job is not only to help you achieve something, but it's to help me get there as well. <laughs> Amen. I'm on this journey too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of God so what is Paul saying he's saying don't judge until we get to the judgment when you're standing there watching your brother and your sister in Christ answering to the Lord for the things they've done in the flesh, then you can start making judgments. You know why? Because at that moment in time, everything's going to be brought to light. You're not just going to see the action. You're going to see the motivation. You're not just going to see the action. You're going to see the circumstances that brought about that action. How many times do we sit in judgment of others? How many times do we cri criticize? and condemn others because what we see and what we see may not even be one-tenth of the story. Mm -hmm. We didn't see what brought this about. Oh, we sit in judgment of that mother who cracks, as it were, psychologically and emotionally and takes a gun and shoots her own children. We sit in judgment. We start condemning her. And we start saying all kind of evil things about her. But only God knows what demons that mother was fighting. Only God knows what kind of confusion and what kind of darkness had encompassed her mind and her thoughts. Do you know what I'm telling you today? Oh, we need to be careful about how we judge others because one day Jesus is going to look like you and he's going to look at you and I and he's going to say, okay, now it's judgment time. Why don't I look at things the way you always looked at things? Why don't I look at your life the way you always looked at everybody else's life? Because God knows that in the flesh we always cut ourselves a whole lot more slack and we always give ourselves a whole lot more room for failure and flop than we do others and I tell them the truth mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. 
God knows when we screw up, we just will sit there and justify ourselves and we'll explain it away. We have all the answers. Well, first of all, we know a lot more than other people know about the circumstance. How many times do we explain away our conduct? Well, sure, you can do it, and you can do it legitimately because you know more of the circumstance. You know more of the situation. You have a more complete picture of everything. But what about those who judge you for that very same act who don't know squat about the circumstance, who don't know squat about the situation, who only were privy to that one few moments when you acted the fool, am I telling the truth? Oh, they're going to stand before God one day. And honey, it's going to turn into the scariest day in eternity when Jesus suddenly morphs and becomes them. And he looks at their actions and says, Oh, let's forget about why you did it. Let's forget about what led up to it. Because after all, you never took that into account when you looked at others. No, 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 no. Let's put those facts aside. We don't need to see that. No, no. The way you like to judge is I can make a sound judgment based on what I've seen, glory to God, because that's all I need to see. How many times have you heard somebody say, that's all I need to see? Wait until Jesus is standing in front of them at the judgment and he looks just like them and says, That's all I need to see. Woo. What about this one? There's no excuse. There's no excuse for him doing that. There's no excuse for her doing that. How many times have we sat in, in judgment of other believers? You know, my grandfather, bless his heart, I honestly believe I can say with all sincerity that there was never a man on this planet who believed the gospel of Jesus Christ more passionately than my grandfather did. I also believe I can say in sincerity that there was never a man who wrestled with more demons and had more issues and struggled with more things than my grandfather. His conduct at times was beyond deplorable. It was hideous. It was horrible. He could cuss like a sailor's parrot. He... he <sighs> Much of the time he had a fuse that was so short that the match didn't even need to touch it before it was lit. You could be standing across the room and strike a match and Grandpa's fuse was lit. He just had such a short fuse he'd become so angry. He'd yell and holler and scream and carry on. And he cussed like a sailor's parrot. But his faith in God, I assure you, was genuine. It was real. I know it was. He could believe God for healing faster than anybody I know could believe God for healing. But he had a whole thing. And when I look at my grandfather's life, I've learned, I've learned to judge righteous judgment which the Lord told us to do. I've learned to look at him and say, I don't know everything that brought him to this place. I, I don't understand all the circumstances in his life that have brought him. I don't know what demons he's wrestling with, literal demons he's wrestling with. I don't know what kind of darkness in his mind he is struggling with. You know, I don't know what battles he's lost. I don't know what... Uh, issues he has succumbed to that are causing him all this trouble so that he behaves this way. Do you follow what I'm saying? But you know what? I can look at my grandfather honestly today and he's gone on. He's going to stand before the Lord. He's going to answer for these things. But I can honestly, I grew to the point where I could look at my grandpa and I could say, I know he's a believer. I know that he's been baptized in Jesus' name. I know that the man uh, honestly embraces the gospel with everything that's in him. 
I don't know a whole lot else. I don't understand a lot of why he does a lot of what he does. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave it in God's hands because God ain't never called me to be the judge. That's right. But now it's funny, I can, I can cut slack for my grandpa because I love my grandpa. But you know what? We've been called to behave this way with everyone. If we can learn simply to look at actions and behaviors and conduct of believers and non-believers alike and abstain from judgment, simply acknowledge, I don't know all the facts. Paul said, don't make any judgment until you know all the facts. Well, the only day you're going to know all the facts is judgment day. Hello now. So therefore, you need to keep your mouth shut. You need to keep your spirit under control until Jesus comes. Hello now. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. You know, I've known people who were so kind and so loving and so non-judgmental Listen to me now, because this statement is sad at the same time. They were so non-judgmental and so kind and so sweet that they made me sick. <laughs> you ever known somebody like that? I mean, bless God, you couldn't get them to say nothing bad about nobody. You could, you could sit there and spew your judgment about somebody, and they would just sit there and say, Well, bless their heart, I don't know. I don't know what brought them there. I don't know. And we're looking at that person. We're thinking, you dirty dog. <laughs> you need to grow some. You need to get yourself some uh, backbone. Because, listen, yeah, the evidence is right in front of you. You ought to be able to, to put a label on this one, honey. If you can't see it, there's something wrong with you. How many of us have done that? You know who one of the most hated people in the Christian faith in the last century has been? Tammy Faye Baker. You want to know what Tammy Faye's, one of her greatest faults was? She was the most loving, non-judgmental person on this planet. She could look at a man who starred in porn movies and not be judgmental. As she was on that show with him, you know, on television with him. She could look at a stripper. She could look at a prostitute. She could look at the most sinful among us. She could look at an individual dying with AIDS at a time when people were still terrified to even so much as be in the room with someone with AIDS, never mind put their hand on them. And she could go in that room with that person and she could hug them and tell them the Lord loves you and so do I. And people that call themselves Christians hated her. You know why? Tell you why. Because she looked more like Jesus than you ever will. Let me tell you a little secret. There is a reason why we're called to look more and more like Jesus in this life. Listen to me carefully now. The more we look like Jesus, the more Jesus will look like himself when we're facing him in judgment. Uh oh Hmm. Think about it. The more we look like Him, the more He'll be able to look like Himself when we stand before Him in judgment. Oh my goodness and mercy. You can condemn her for her makeup. You can condemn her for her dress and her style and whatever you want to. And I don't put people in heaven and I don't put people in hell. Because, honey, I've said it a million times. God never called me to be judge. And you can say, well, you're copping out, preacher. If you don't preach, this one's going to hell and that one's going to hell. You're copping out. No, I'm not copping out at all. I am doing what the Word of God tells me to do. I'm abstaining from sitting in the seat of the judge. I know better than to try to be the judge. I'm not dumb enough. 
to try to do God's job for him. Because, honey, the minute I do that, when I stand before the Lord in judgment and Jesus starts to look like me, oh, my Lord, have mercy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be shaking in my boots. I'm going to be scared out of my mind when I look up at the Lord on his throne and all of a sudden I'm looking at Charles. And I know how Charles thinks. I know his judgmental nature. I know how critical he can be. Oh, God have mercy. I'm scaring myself to death. I know how he can act. I know how he can be. I know how judgmental and how critical am I to tell the truth and how condemnatory. And all of a sudden, there sits the Lord looking like me. Saying, all right, it's time to judge. I told you. The same manner you judge is the same manner you're going to be judged. I told you. I told you. They say, you didn't get up here without warning. There's a reason the apostles, my apostles, tried to instruct you and help you to look more like me. There's a reason why. It, you know, you were called to take on the mind of Christ. There's a reason why you were called to emulate me. Because had you done so, then I could sit in judgment of you as me instead of as you. Oh, my Lord, do you finally get my message? Do you understand the day Jesus becomes me? In John chapter 7, verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The Lord has advised and instructed us on ways that we can settle matters here on earth so that we do not have to face them in the judgment. Not only are we going to face ourselves on judgment day as Jesus morphs into us so he can judge us by the same standard that we have judged. But God, in His kindness and in His goodness, has literally made a way for us to settle some issues after the fact. Because I told you, if you don't judge, you won't be judged. Well, most of us have failed on that front. So now the Lord said, but, but I made a way for you to fix some things you've done wrong, so that when you stand before me in judgment, you won't have to answer for these things. These issues won't even come up. Lord, you're kidding. There's a way for me to settle things here on earth. Yes, there is. In Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, the Lord said, Take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee. Rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. I'm going to repeat that. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. In other words, if somebody done you dirty, honey, you need to let them know. I want to tell you a little secret. There's this game human beings love to play. They get mad at you. And you go to them and you say, are you upset with me? Are you mad at me? And they say, you ought to know. Did I do something to offend you? You know what you said. I tell you, I get so tired of these immature jackasses that play these games. Word of God said, if your brother offend you, rebuke him. In other words, you got to tell me. Because I'm going to tell you a little secret. There are times I'll say things, there are times I'll do things, and I'm honestly... <laughs> I may do it so innocently it's not even funny. I, you know, it might just be something I let, you know, I might have been having a bad day. It, God only knows what could have been the motivation or what could have been the cause. But if you sit there and give me this, well, you should know. After all, you're psychic and you can read my mind. You should know. No, tell me. Rebuke me. Brother, you said thus and so. You actually said thus and so to me. And that hurt me. 
Oh. But now here's the key. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, and if he repent, forgive him. Say, okay, so I'm supposed to forgive him. No, it's not what Jesus said. Listen. He said, if he repent, forgive him. Okay, Pastor, I get it. I'm supposed to forgive him. I'm obligated. To... No, 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 you're not listening. There is a condition that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the singular physical manifestation of Almighty God in the earth, there is something he said. He attached a condition to your forgiveness. Listen to me, children. He said, if he repent, if he doesn't repent, you can't forgive. If he turns around and says, well, bless God, you deserved it because you were acting like a donkey. <laughs> you cannot forgive someone who is unrepentant. But you also cannot expect an unrepentant person to repent so you can forgive them unless you tell them what the problem is. And don't play this game, you know, you should know. You know how many people left our church in a huff over some of the stupidest, most asinine things I've ever heard or seen in my life. And it takes years and years and years before I finally get word that it was over some little, tiny, tenancy, idiotic, stupid thing that if they would have just come to me and said something, we could have solved it, hugged each other's necks, cried a little, been over it, and moved on. And the work of God could have benefited by people who know how to act like people of the kingdom. Instead of acting like people of the world who run around holding grudges and being angry with one another and being mad and, and having an attitude and acting stupid. Hello now. Are God's people, are we not called to act differently than the world acts? Mm -hmm. So if you got a problem with somebody, you need to go to them. You need to, you need to tell them what the problem is and give them an opportunity to repent of that. If they repent, you then forgive them. Now listen to me carefully. When you forgive them that, they will never have to answer to God for that in eternity. That matter, according to the Word of God, and I'm going to share it with you in a minute, that matter is settled forever, both on earth and in heaven. The minute you forgive somebody who has repented, someone who has apologized and acknowledged something that they've done to you that was hurtful or harmful or offensive, the minute you forgive that person, they will never have to face God in the judgment with that issue. That's why, listen to me now, that is why if somebody comes to you and they claim you have offended or hurt them, don't act the fool. Don't sit there and justify yourself and explain yourself away and act like you've got all kind of reasons for why you did what you did and you were fully justified. Don't you act the fool. Listen, if I accidentally stab you with a knife, you're going to get hurt. You may bleed out and die. If I've done it on purpose, then obviously I did it with malice. But whether I do it with malice or I don't do it with malice, I still hurt you. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? If I accidentally stab somebody, you better believe I'm going to say, Oh dear God, I'm so sorry. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The same thing is true when somebody comes to us and they say, Hey, this hurt me, this offended me, this troubled me. Then all we need to do is respond as children of God. The first words off our lips ought to be, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I was not trying to hurt you. That wasn't at all my motivation, and I am so sorry. You know how much healing there would be in the world if people would just apologize? If people would just acknowledge? All you got to do is acknowledge it. 
Listen, I want to go on with this. I'm almost, almost done. I'm trying to wind this up today. Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Again, Jesus speaking said, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive, which is in heaven. For, uh, excuse me, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So you see, when we forgive, we open the door for forgiveness. So by forgiving others, then we're allowing God, we're giving God opportunity to forgive us. If we don't forgive, uh-oh, all we're doing is heaping a whole bunch of trouble on our head on Judgment Day. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Now listen to this. Matthew 5, 22 through 24. Again the Lord is speaking. He said, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thy, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Gee, the Jehovah's tell us hell ain't real. There ain't no fiery place of hell. Sure there is. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest, Listen, that thy brother have aught against thee. So now this isn't you being upset and therefore you go to the person who upset you and tell them what they've done. Listen, this is the, a slightly different circumstance. Said if you go to the altar and suddenly you remember, wait a minute, you know what? So and so is offended at me. So and so's not talking to me because they're mad at me and they're upset with me. Blah, blah, blah. And you remember that someone else has ought against you. Listen, the Lord said, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I want to tell you a little secret, children. God doesn't want His people running around with a whole bunch of unfinished business. He doesn't want us running around like the world with all kind of issues with carrying around a whole bunch of grudges and being angry about a whole bunch of things. No. God's people ought to man up and act like adults. And if we have an issue, go to that person and let's settle it. We ought to be able, if we know someone's upset with us, go to them and settle it. I have written messages online by email and what have you over Facebook. I've sent messages to people that I know I did things to when I was a kid. Just stupid, stupid stuff. And I know that that action still could have hurt them and still could have caused them even ongoing trouble in their life right into their adulthood. And I've written them messages and I said, listen, I want to tell you I am so sorry. I'm so sorry I said this. I'm so sorry I did this. There was a person that I dated once and years and years and years and years ago, long before the current queen sat in the throne, okay? And this person, I really liked this person a lot, but my ex and I had been, had been apart, and we decided to get back together. And like a child, like an immature child, I was trying to like, put distance between me and this person, you know, because I really liked this person so that I could get back with my ex and all. You know, I was just a young person. And in the process of doing this, I said some things to this person's roommate about him that were just stupid and hurtful and dumb. And of course, it got back to him, you know. 
Well, years and years and years later, I never forgot that I did that. I, I, I never forgot that I did it because I knew how stupid it was. Years and years and years later, I found him on Facebook and I sent him a message and I said, listen, I want to tell you sincerely, honestly, you're a terrific person and I am so sorry that I acted so stupid and that I said those hurtful things about you. I should never have said that. Do you follow what I'm saying? I gave that person an opportunity to forgive me. I gave that person the opportunity to settle this matter on earth so that I would never have to face it in heaven. Because I know how to act now like a grown up child of God instead of some little prissy, sissy child. But the Lord said, if you know somebody's got all against you, you ought to go to them and try to settle the matter. Get it rectified. Settle before you even come back to present your gift before the altar. Hello now. Now listen to this. In the Lord's Prayer, we're all familiar with the words, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now listen. The term debtors, the Lord didn't use this without purpose and without cause and without reason. There are people, there, there's a girl, a woman who was attending our church for a while, she and her partner. And she begged and pleaded me one day to lend her some money for gas. You remember that? And, and she needed gas, and her partner was starting a job, and she needed gas money and all this. And she begged and pleaded, and I tried to tell her. I said, honey, I, I hate to tell you, but I am not in a position. I just don't have it. And back when she was asking me, I'm telling you, I was living hand to mouth, and I, I honestly couldn't afford to do nothing. For nobody. I couldn't hardly pay my own stuff. And she said, well, I'll be paying it back on Thursday or whatever day, you know. Because she's going to get a check on this in the day. And I'll be paying back. And I promise, I promise. And I said to her, I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now. If I lend this to you, I'm going to have to get it back. Honestly. I, I, I just have to be truthful. I would have to get it back. Because I'm giving you money that I was going to pay a bill with, and if I don't have that money, I'm not going to be able to pay my bill. Well, that day came, and guess what happened? She and her partner weren't coming to church anymore. All of a sudden, they just dipped out of the picture for a while. All of a sudden, they weren't coming to church. I never did get that money back. Never did see it. Now I have an option. I can either run around and carry a grudge toward this woman the rest of my life, or when I pray and stand before God, like the Lord said, I can forgive the debt. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Debt is a specific term that applies to specific things. Somebody owes you something, and you're basically saying, Lord, I release that. That person don't owe me nothing anymore. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that be. And again, by your doing this, you're giving that person an out. Hopefully, God's people are giving each other outs all the time, and there'll be a whole lot of garbage goes on in the church we don't have to answer to the Lord for in the judgment. But listen, in Matthew 18, 15 through 18, the Lord said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. In other words, keep it private between you and that person. And to, to uh, excuse me, between thee and him alone, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, Tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto the as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, 
whatsoever, listen carefully children, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is the Lord saying? I've heard that passage, I've heard that line quoted a million times growing up in the Pentecostal church. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And we got people running around binding this and binding that and binding their bowels and binding that and blah, blah. And it is stupid. It is a complete misuse and misunderstanding of what Jesus was saying. Look at it in context, folks. The term binding in the Lord's time was a legal term, as it is today. If we say you have a binding contract, that means you have a contract that is legal and legitimate and will stand up in a court of law. It literally, legally holds both parties to whatever the conditions of that contract are. The term binding that Jesus is using here means the identical same thing. What the Lord is saying is, when you settle a matter and you and it's settled, he said that it is a binding contract. And it is not only binding on earth, but it is binding in heaven. It is not only settled on earth, it is settled in heaven. You remember I said a few moments ago, when you talk to somebody and they repent and you forgive them, you just have created a binding agreement between the two of you that this matter is settled. Now, in heaven, you will never face that issue. That issue is a non-issue. It has literally been wiped off the map. It's been wiped off the face of the planet. Because two believers have behaved as they ought to behave, and they have settled the matter, and the contract is binding. You have bound it on earth, it is therefore bound in heaven. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, I wish God's people understood the Word of God as it's meant to be understood. Instead of all this foolish, childish misunderstanding and misrepresentation. Listen to me now. The Lord said, if you go to a brother that you have an issue with and you tell him one on one and he doesn't listen to you. He said, then you get two more people. Two or three more people to go with you. So now you go. The reason you do that is now you have witnesses. Okay? That man can't say, well, he's accusing me of this and so because you have people there who heard you accuse him of whatever the issue might be. Said, if he don't want to hear the three or four of you, said, then you go ahead and you tell it to the church. Now, the best way to do that generally, if it's done right, and if the preacher not know how to act right, you tell the pastor, you let the pastor know. Then the pastor will address the issue with the, with the congregation. And if the pastor has any wisdom, has any love in his heart, knows how to act, he'll be able to do it in a way that it, you know, it's, it's not uh, real combative and, and confrontational, you know, and if that person still doesn't respond, then at that point, you have to recognize, listen to me now, there's a reason the Lord said you treat that person as though they're, uh, you know, a, uh, I'm going to use his exact words here, as though he were a heathen and a publican. There's a reason why you're going to now Look at that person as a heathen and a publican. It's very simple. They're not acting like a child of God. Therefore, why in the world should you treat them as a child of God? If you're not going to act like God's child, then heaven knows I'm not going to treat you like God's child. Now listen to me. Does this passage support the notion of shunning? No. No. Not even remotely close. Not even near close. How are we supposed to treat heathens and publicans? Well, the Word of God said, love your enemies. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Doesn't the Word of God say we're to love everybody, whether they're in the church or out of the church? Doesn't matter. You don't shun that person because you are now looking at them as a heathenist. But no, but when you talk to them and they try to act all Christian-like and talk all, you know, blah, blah, you know in your heart that person ain't living right, so they ain't no sense of even talking this trash. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm not going to treat them as a believer because they don't act like a believer. And I may even tell them that. You hear what I'm telling you now? It has nothing to do with shunning. It simply has to do with you now look at them and understand them differently. You, you, now, you know what? Uh, we've got examples, Tommy, right here in our own church of people. You and I have talked about it recently. And I said, you know, there are some people who have acted the fool and they've done some hurtful things, some nasty things. I've tried to talk to them about it. They don't want to hear nothing. They don't want to, they refuse to acknowledge anything. They're just going to keep acting the way they're acting. But they still want to act like they're my buddy, my friend. They still want to, you know, chat me up online. They still want to call me on the telephone. So, and I've told them, I said, I'm sorry, but you know, Things have changed. I, I just don't see you the way I used to see you. I, you know, I just don't feel the obligation to do these things like, a, like we used to do when I counted you as a brother. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, am I not going to talk to that person if I see him in a grocery store? Or if I go, No, there's no reason for me to do that. I have no reason in the universe to shun them or to mistreat them or, you know, to be hateful toward them. I don't feel hate toward them. I'm kind of disgusted and upset and aggravated with them because they don't want to hear nothing and they don't want to act right and they want me to look at them as a child of God but they don't want to act like a child of God and I have a problem with that you follow what I'm saying today it's not about shunning it's about how we see and perceive them now listen the scariest day in eternity will be the day that the Lord becomes us the day that Jesus sits over us to judge us, and to do so, he takes upon himself our image. This won't give us a free pass. It will not give us leniency. God's standard of righteousness and justice will still apply. Only the magnitude and severity of our judgment on earth will be exercised against us when we stand before the Lord. We would do well in this life to remember that we will one day face ourselves, as it were, in judgment. Mm -hmm. The same judgment we practice in this life will be turned against us in God's judgment. The less we judge, the less we will be judged. The less harshly we sit in judgment of others, the less harshly we will be judged by the Lord. The more issues we have been able to settle and seal in this life, the fewer issues we will later have to answer for when we stand before the Lord. Lastly, this afternoon, Revelation 11, 15 through 18, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, not they, he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, 
and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and, should, and shouldest destroy them. Listen, you remember I preached on, on uh, global warming? It says, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Judgment's coming. Some of y'all say, Oh, Pastor, this wasn't one of them nice, light, and airy messages. I don't feel all fluffy. I don't feel like a bunny rabbit ready to run through the field today like I do sometimes when you preach. No, this is one of those messages that's a little bit heavier, but it's necessary. Because if we're going to live this thing the way we've been called to live it, we need to understand today what? There's a day coming when Jesus is going to become me. Amen. Mm -hmm.